Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is the legendary Bill Sienkiewicz. Bill, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's really great, great to be here. Real, real pleasure. Bill, you are a guest that I've been hoping to have on the show for the longest time. I'm so glad that you're here because I really wanted to talk about your evolution as an artist. And I know you've probably been asked this question many times before, but your beginning work in comics is more in a traditional vein. Your work on the Fantastic Four is, you know, very good, but it's not what you would later be known for. So I'm wondering, where was it uh, somewhere along that Moon, Moon Knight run, somewhere in that New Mutants run that you sort of discovered your voice and, and were able to go with it. Yeah, I mean, my, um, it, you know, I don't think it was anything that was planned. Um, I think that uh, I knew that from a very young age that I wanted to draw comic books or, or be involved in, in comics, telling stories. Um, so a lot of the comics that I read, and, and you know, people who know my work at all, um, are well aware of the fact that my, my major influence was Neil Adams at a certain point, but I've been influenced by comics in general and comic strips. So at one point in, in my, you know, at, at any given point, anybody from, uh, you know, Milton Kniff to Sergio Aragonis to Sal Buscema to John, I mean, have, has sort of crossed the, the transom. Um, I just felt like I was a sponge. But uh, so when I was drawing comics in grammar school for my friends and for myself, and then all the way through high school, a lot of the comics that I read were sort of put into the comics that I was drawing. So when I finally did get into comic books, I think that um, um, I've sort of passed through sort of the the, the um, all of the influences that I had I had while I was growing up. And, um, but I still love the medium. So I, the, I've fallen in love with fine art and illustration, abstract expressionism. So that's where my head was at. And that was what I was putting a lot, a lot of that kind of stuff into my sketchbooks. For some reason, I wanted to try to, you know, shoehorn that into comics. And um, that was, you know, when I met with quite a bit of resistance or, you know, you can't do that or that's not how it's done, that kind of thing. And uh, no reason, there was no reason ever given. It was just simply, you know, sort of the uh the standard you know that's not comics and i'm, I'm like I, I, why why you know why not you know that that kind of thing but um so that was that was kind of you know what happened at the time that i decided to try it to try to push things around um uh you know there were a couple of things that really set that off though and i realize i'm taking a long time with the very first question but there was um uh i started to get a, a lot of pushback of my, about my Neil Adams influence. Very negative type stuff um, that at least felt that way. It's like, you know, looks like Bill Sienkiewicz was influenced by, you know, Neil Adams, you know, period, you know, end of story, which made me feel kind of invisible uh, and upset, angry, because I was, I grew up in, in farm country. So there were no adults around to sort of say, you know, who would say, learn to be yourself, you know, just follow your, your dream, etc. I just ended up drawing uh, this stuff. And when I got into comics and then when I started getting those responses, I thought I'm either going to do comics the way I want to do them or I'm going to get out. That's really what it came down to. That's pretty much was the, the turning point for me was I'm just going to try uh, all the things that were in my sketchbook. It's fascinating because I was, I was looking back at your Moon Knight work, which I had not really read. It was a little before my, my comic reading time. Um, and it was just amazing to see there is that moment when you say uh, there's that Neil Adams influence that's there. But then you start to see it changing and you sort of become this, uh, I guess you were working with Klaus Janssen uh, on a few of those issues and you can see where you're sort of blending your style with, with his style and then things just start happening. You do different tones, you, you start to play with, uh, with zipatone or duotone patterns and it just takes mm -hmm. on this, this wild life. And then when you take over New Mutants after uh, the very accomplished Bob McCloud, it's just a whole new ball game. And I remember picking up that first issue at the, the local uh, comic shop and just being blown away and not quite understanding everything you were doing, but just knowing it was something special. So when you're kind of given that free reign and, and sort of let go, uh, as an artist, how does that help you tell that story? Those issues, like to go back to the Moon Knight, you know, uh, when I finally, um, I think the kind of, 
part of the precipitating factor for me to change styles was also breaking my drawing hand and um uh which you know caused a whole life changing sort of i'm gonna you know uh just concentrate on, on doing the best work that i can and and not allow any impediments or fears to kind of get in the way um and so when i finally left moon Knight after 30 issues i think it was three years i felt like three years was kind of a good place to end it. And I want, I was also interested in painting. I started doing a lot of cover paintings for like the Dazzler and ROM and a couple of other, other ones. And, and I had turned down the X-Men. Um, I wanted to concentrate on more uh, expansive, different technical aspects of, of the work and um, being offered the X-Men was, was certainly an honor, but I also felt that I wanted to try stuff that, might not be conducive to Marvel's flagship book. I might, I felt like I might drive it into a ditch and I didn't want to do that because I wanted to, I wanted to experiment. And uh, there was, that could go either way. So uh, it wasn't until Chris Claremont, uh, he came up to me in the hallway. I, uh, I remember it was like a 30 second pitch. He said um, about the new mutants. And I'd seen the new mutants. I love what Bob was doing, um, but I had no real interest in doing more, issues of anything it was going to be you know hit and miss and i was going to pop in pop out the idea of doing another series after three years on moon Knight was not something i was looking forward to um and chris said it's a three issue series that's a it's a demon bear it's it involves a lot of you know demons and sort of dreams dream logic etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is what piqued my interest because it felt like I could go, dreams don't have to make sense. So I, I could play with illogic or with abstraction or anything. Plus I was heavily into uh, Hunter Thompson at the time and uh, Ralph Steadman and animation, uh, you know, Chuck Jones, Tex Avery. I was really kind of coupled with, you know, Robert Motherwell and Franz Klein in the, in the abstract expression, Robert Rauschenberg. It was just this, this collision of highbrow, lowbrow, whatever you want to call it in terms of how people perceive it. So when, uh, when Chris came to me and said that, literally offered me a 30 second uh, synopsis. And I, at the end of it, I went to my, my great surprise. I said, I'm in. And I thought, well, three issues. And then we had so much fun. We just said, let's, let's keep it going. Um, but I do know that the response to, uh, to my coming on board uh, to the great delight of, of editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, who used to call me into his office and read me the letters, uh, you know, stop him, Jim, before he kills again, that kind of, those kinds of letters. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very interesting uh, sort of path. Uh, you know, those 30-second conversations, you never know where, where they may lead. Really interesting. You say that you, you broke your hand and you just sort of went with what you were able to do while it was, uh, uh, I guess, healing up. And you create this style that it's, it's kind of like we, we talk about comics before Jack Kirby, we talk about comics before Neil Adams and after, and then it's comics after you, uh, because you're at that time yeah. when, when paper is changing, printing is improving, and you're able to do different things. So I know that you're working in, uh, in different mediums to do covers, you're doing p these painted covers, and I'm just wondering, as the, the times are changing and your style of artwork is becoming, uh, well, capable, I mean, something that they could reproduce uh, on the page that previously couldn't be done, uh, how does that sort of, you know, guide you in, in what you want to do with the next project? Well, at the time that I was, that I was doing the, um, uh, the painted covers, I had also wanted to do, when I was in art school, I had also wanted to do uh, movie posters and TV guide covers, Time Magazine covers, sort of the... the the creme de la creme of a lot of my illustration influences. And uh, when I was in comics I, and I started to try to do more painted stuff, like with the, the movie adaptations, but there were really no painted covers on comics. Although growing up with like, um, I think they were gold key. I think like Turok, Son of Stone. And there were other ones that had some painted covers, but I don't remember any Marvel comic covers having painted covers at all, um, everything was line art. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was doing some of the issues of Moon Knight, I thought, let's do some, let's do, do black and white covers with tone. And I think 
Danny O'Neill, who was the editor at the time, said, "Let you know, let's do it every other cover. I think you know, doing every cover might be a bit much." But um, again, that had to do with my desire to do experimentation, and the handbreaking had to do with you know being grown up, growing up in the country, and and drinking quite a bit, smoking, and etc. And when I, I had gotten very, very drunk in, in my twenties, uh, you know, and then I had broken my drawing hand. And I, I led, led me to quit drinking. It just like I, I just thought everything I'm working toward in terms of my art career is uh, it's amazing how quickly it could just go like that. So uh, so that kind of freed me up in a weird way to try this, these different stylistic uh, approaches. The printing process at the time was also very for comics was uh, certainly not where it is now. I mean, I look at the older covers that I did for the Dazzler and some for Rom, and the dot pattern on the covers is so sparse. I mean, you could drive a tractor trailer through the, you know, through that. Whereas, um, uh, you know, now, I mean, with digital, it's amazing. I mean, I, I actually would have to construct pieces or paint pieces or scan or take the photo or have it photographed at Marvel. Um, there was a whole technical exercise that is just taken for granted now that you don't need, you know, you know, I mean, everything now could be done right on a, on a screen. Uh, I still love the idea of something being done actually by hand, uh, you know, physically painted. Um, although I bounce back and forth depending on what the project is, but, um, but yeah, at the time, technically there was really, uh, uh, no kind of blueprint for how to go about doing it. But luckily I had great editors and people in production who were willing, they were looking for challenges as well. So um, having people like Ann Vicente and Ralph Macchio as editors and, he, and Shooter as well saying, you know, I don't understand what you're trying to do, but, um, but hey, let's, you know, let's see, like throw it against the wall and see what sticks. So, uh, you know, it wasn't done in a vacuum, let's put it that way. I was lucky to have so many really amazing people who were working alongside and sort of pushed me. So go ahead, try your thing. Let's let's see what what, what works. Now it's interesting. You talk about uh, Jim Shooter reading you letters, negative letters, and I imagine for a young artist, that's got to be soul crushing because I know you know as you get older, as I get older, and I do work, I can handle criticism because you know I've been doing it long enough. I know what works, what doesn't work, and maybe what I need to improve. But as a young artist, is he doing this in a way that's designed to help you improve, oh, or is it just to kind of? Oh, maybe well, I should, I should I should clarify. That's a great question. I'm glad. He, thanks for giving me the opportunity to clarify it. Uh, Jim and I, uh, you know, we uh, we had a, a, a sort of this uh, brotherly kind of uh, you know relationship, even though he was my boss. Uh, he also, we also were comfortable enough. We'd have dinner occasionally and, and, uh, cause of similar similarities in our upbringing, we, we also felt comfortable enough to sort of bust each other's chops, which was, could have been very, very dangerous, you know, uh, in terms of career. <laughs> but, uh, when he would call me in, I mean, he took great delight and, and it was, you know, it was obvious that he was, he was really enjoying himself. Um, but at the same time, he was the one who was giving me the green light and the carte blanche to try my stuff. At the same time, he would also say, you know, you know, damn you and your, your, you know, your non-primary color palette. You know, it's, <laughs> that's not comics. You're using all these grays. What's all, but he would do it with, say it with like great, you know, affection and also, uh, you know, uh, humor, uh, so uh, again, he got to, he, in the history of, of Marvel Comics during that era, I think he gets, uh, you know, cast as a villain, which is supposedly, I mean, for Marvel Comics to be cast as a villain, probably a great role for people to be, you know, in, in retrospect. But, um, but he was, you know, very supportive in a lot of ways for, from both myself and people like Frank Miller and Klaus Jansen. He was a, a real cheerleader. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, just, at, if for no no other reason, it's like I like to just get the opportunity to say, you know, he wasn't uh, he was actually a, a really terrific guy to work with and and work for. You had the opportunity uh, while at Marvel to uh, write your own series, Straight Toasters, and you got to work mm -hmm. with Frank Miller 
on the uh, Electra saga. And I'm just wondering, uh, you go from those types of stories and then you also start doing some inking. So I'm just wondering if you could touch a little bit on, on your, your work on straight toasters, telling that story the way that you wanted to tell it, working with Frank, who obviously has a strong mindset on how he wants to tell a story, and then working with another artist on their work to help them tell a story, but from a secondary role. Maybe I'll take the second part of the question first, is that, you know, growing up again, I, anybody who reads comics knows that, that in terms of the medium, that it's such a collaborative one, you know. Uh, it can sometimes be conceived or perceived as the uh, assembly line, you know, procedure, you know, where it's like, you know, okay, I'm going I'm to, like a car, I'm, I'm doing the windshields, you do the bumper, Whereas comics, it's like you've got somebody doing the pencils or the breakdowns, and then the classic, you know, combinations of of great inking penciling duos, you know, Joe Sinnott and Jack over Jack Kirby or or Klein over over Swan or you know you, any number of people where you know you, you see the the combination of their work as a third entity. There's the penciling and inking styles. You put them together and you get this other le level of magic. Which is again the wonderful thing about comics is that the the writing and the art are put together in such a way that you get something that is greater than the sum of the parts as well. Um, and I always love the idea of uh, kind of looking through another artist's eyes and walking in their metaphorical or you know footsteps so that how they perceive things. So um, so when I would ink other artists, um, to me, it was a, a chance to remain in the world of comics, sort of honor the past that I grew up with. Plus, it was a lot of fun because I didn't feel like I, I had my, my own ego invested. Like, it wasn't all me. It wasn't like, you know, my layouts, my, you know, story. Um, I felt like I was coming in as sort of an extra set of hands and someone who's, who could you know, were my ego or my, you know, it wasn't all riding on my shoulders in terms of, of the productivity of it and the success of it. Uh, I was part of a team and I enjoyed that and I still do. Uh, although I don't really ink over a lot of other people now, mostly been inking like someone like, like Dennis Cowan who I've known for years and we've, you know, we fit together really, really well. And that's not to say I wouldn't love to ink somebody else again. I mean, I've, I've been so blessed and fortunate to ink people like Sal Buscema and John Buscema, um, Jim Aparo. I mean, some of my heroes. I would have, would have loved to have gotten the chance to ink over Nick Cardi, who became a really dear friend. Um, and even uh, there, was been, there were times when I inked over Joe Sinnott for some of his, you know, uh, charity work that he would do. But... Uh, that's a whole different world than writing, drawing, painting, determining the whole the whole process. It's you know it's like somebody putting out an album, to, you know, an entire album, you know, play, by playing all the instruments, or or a film director, you know, directing, acting, writing, producing, starring in, um, you know, doing the set design and costume. It's like it sort of feels like. Um, it's a very daunting task, but at the same time, what's lo what's lovely about it is that it's the most exhilarating position I've ever been in, and it's also been the most frightening position. It's that duality, where I feel like I'm on 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 a tightrope, but a little bit more like Wiley e. Coyote, where I've walked off the cliff, you know. And it's like as long as I don't look down, I'm okay, you know. <laughs> so it it does feel. Uh, uh, you know, like a wonderful experience and to have to, to kind of go between, you know, the inking may be a little bit like running back to the cliff and hanging on, you know, where I can also, it's a touchstone while I can go off and do crazier things over here. And then working with Frank was very similar to working by my, with myself. Um, but Frank's also an artist. So he's, he's, he thinks visually and we would challenge each other there. That's again, it, the big umbrella of everything we're discussing is really this sort of collaboration and whether it's collaboration with as a sort of, you know, secondary, you know, part of the process in terms of inking or a true collaboration. And I've been fortunate to collaborate with, with writers like, you know, Chris Claremont or Alan Moore, Frank, I mean, so many other amazing writers, or if I'm even collaborating with myself, which I do look at it that way. 
um, because I thought, well, if I write my own work, I can just write what I really want to draw. And I found that as a writer, which I did all through my, you know, my, my youth, I wrote my, and drew my own comics. But once I got into the business, it was like uh, being slotted in. It's like, okay, you're going to do the penciling or you're going to do inking or you're going to be a writer. Whereas I was much more comfortable in the, in the sort of totality of it all. Um, so, uh, but when I would write my own script, I would sort of hand, you know, take off the hat and give hand myself the, 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 the script. And I go like, you know, Bill Sienkiewicz, the artist wants to strangle Bill Sienkiewicz, the writer because, and Bill Sienkiewicz, the writer say, look, it, it needs to be in there, you know? So, um, it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's still, it's still the, the, the lovely jumble of, uh, of not knowing quite how it's all going to come together, but trusting in the fact that it will. I just wanted to go back to your inking because I've spoken to uh, a couple of artists who have mentioned you as an inker. Klaus Janssen said that you never make a mistake because if you make a line that's not right, you're going to find a way to make it work. He said you'll kind of double down until it works. And Lee Weeks said, well, you were working with him on a Batman series that he wasn't sure if the two of you would pair up, but he said you seemed to understand what he was trying to do more than he did, and you were able to bring out his pencils in a way that made them better than he could have done it himself and still had the feel of both you and him. So if you're working with someone like an Aparo or a Basema and you get those pages, whether they're really tightly drawn or really rough layouts, how do you sort of put your own personality into it, but at the same time preserve their, uh, I guess, essence? Wow, um, that's interesting. I, I don't know if, if there's any way to really put that into words. I mean, Klaus is, is, is phenomenal as an inker and as a penciler, as a storyteller, he's, he's probably one of the, if not the most like conscientious uh, artists I've worked with uh, when I inked up him over the Daredevil end of days project. He really goes deep in terms of what he tries to accomplish. And um, in the entire sort of arena of inking over other artists work is that there is also a level of love and respect and integrity. I know those are kind of broad and big, big words to use when I'm, I'm describing, you know, what some people see as a low, a low art form, you know. But to me, uh, that's one of the things that I love about seeing about what these other creators do. They put something into it, you know, even with John Paul Leon, who was fortunate to ink over. Um, I loved his work so much that when I got his pencils, he was very disappointed with my inks and um, because you didn't change anything. You didn't bill it, didn't bill it up at all. You know, and I'm like, dude, I, I don't want to do that. It's like, I have such respect for what you do. I just wanted to honor that. So he actually convinced me to kind of go back in and sort of, you know, do my, do some of what I guess is some people see as my thing, you know, when I, when I kind of go into it for me, the, it's really about the drawing and, um, and what I can't, it's something I can't quite put into words, but I look at what I get in terms of pencils and I can sort of get a sense of where they're trying to go. And so by virtue of schooling and drawing from life, like studying anatomy that, to me, working in any other, any medium is like learning a different language. It's like, it's, or that it all goes into the pot in terms of helping one communicate better. So if the more I feel like I know by multiple sources, if I get something from say Lee Weeks, who I adore, and I think he's absolutely one of the most brilliant comic book artists ever. I also understand some of the world in which he lives and how he tells a story. I feel like it's partly cerebral in terms of how I'm approaching it, analytical. And then there's another part of it that is completely emotional. And I, it's, it's just simply a gut response that I look at it and I try to bring all of whatever talents, quote unquote, that I have in terms of tech, you know, inking technique or emotion of, of spotting of blacks or, or uh, intent. It, that's really kind of the main thing is like, not that I'm trying to get into the other person's mind and figure out what they want to emphasize, what to downplay, what to play up. 
So it's a little bit like, again, it, it, it comes down to that level of collaboration. And it's, it's not a word that you hear used a lot in terms of comics, that level of when you, because uh, I think of the word empathy a lot, you know, and it's not like, it, it's thought of as, as sort of, you know, on a cultural level, like sort of walking in somebody else's shoes, but it has a whole much, a whole heavier, weightier content, you know, concept. But to me, it's, it's sort of like, what is he trying to do? And how do I simply not just not screw it up? How do I make this? How do I plus it? How do I make it better? How do I, you know, uh, stay out of the way of what he's trying to do? And in the best case scenario, I actually feel like we walked a path together. You know, I mean, that's the only real way I could describe it. I know I didn't really do a good job of that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, because it sounds like I'm talking out of two different camps. You know, one is the the very very much. Um, analytical and process oriented. And then the other part is something that feels very sort of psychic and emotional. And, uh, you know, uh, plus the fact that I just love it. I love working with other people. So it, it's, and I get to work by myself too. So it's, it's like, as far as a career goes to be able to be like, draw comic books really, uh, it's not a bad one. You know, it's, it's a, to quote Larry David, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty good, you know, so. Well, well, Bill, I'm going to have to, I hate to interrupt you here, but they are telling us that we are out of time. Uh, I want okay. to thank you so much for this half hour. It has flown by and it has been a lot of fun. Oh, it's been, it's been really so much fun. And, and uh, I know I, I, I went on and on, but uh, I hope I gave you something to work with. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. An absolute pleasure on my part. I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon.